can just start when you're when you feel you're ready. When, when, when I feel so I'm ready at this point. Okay. <laughs> Nobody did say that. So Hello, everyone. Nobody said that. Thought that was a good way to quiet everyone down. Uh, my name is Michael Byers. Some of you, probably very few of you, might know me as the the host of the podcast, The Shameless Picture Show. But when I'm not doing that, I'm also a filmmaker. And uh, filmmaking can be a struggle, but we do it because we love the medium and we love trying to make films. Success comes and goes, but we continue on chasing the weird dream of telling stories through movie pictures. So welcome to our panel that's simply titled, Making It. Can everyone hear me all right? There seems to be a lot of background noise back there. It's gonna be that way, buddy, so fuck with me. Sounds great. <laughs> Just making sure that, you know, I'm projecting it up. But in this panel, that I, as I said was simply titled Making It, I am joined by a, a cast of motley, but very, six, you know, very talented filmmakers. I almost said successful, but I realize none of us have had a whole lot of success. No. Uh, <laughs> first, we've got someone I've known probably since college, uh, uh, Joseph K. Richards. Uh, he's a filmmaker, local filmmaker. He jumps around in styles and genre, but uh, you're best known, I'd say, for your future film projects. Mo uh, I think most recently is Batman and Jesus. Yep. Um, another film called Wayward Son, which had its premiere at this film festival a couple years ago. I think, right? Am I right? It, the first festival it was in. Okay. We did one show before. And then my personal favorite, the Amateur Monster movie. He also used to be the co-host of the web show Friday Night Weekly. <laughs> Next to him we have Casey T. Malone. Is it Malone or Maloney? Malone. Malone, who is a writer, director, and composer. He's directed award-winning films such as Dead Man's Carnival, A Conversation of Pinkerton Xyloma, and he recently completed his feature film, Lesser Beasts. <laughs> I'll cue you all. We'll continue that going. And then next to him, we have Chris Marks, who is a professional gaffer by trade, as you told me. Yeah. But he's also a passionate filmmaker and an accomplished bass player. Uh, Chris Mark's film, Three Days, will be part of the anniversary screenings in the next block. Yeah. So, I think the, the, the most obvious way to begin this panel, as a group of filmmakers and people who I assume all still love film, maybe not you, because I've known a lot of gaffers who have grown to hate film working on films, <laughs> but Let's delve a little deeper into, into this of subject of why film? Why did you choose to get involved with it? So we'll, we'll work our way down. Uh, hi. For me, um, getting into film, um, at a really young age, I was really interested in telling stories and like bringing characters to life. So I would draw a lot of stories. When I found a camera, I thought, great, I can actually make these into videos. And then when, when deciding between television, which I actually liked more as a kid, and films, I think what, what made me go a little bit more towards film was that I found myself watching movies that were like 50, 60 years old. And I wasn't really watching TV that was that old. So I thought, wow, the longevity of these films. I'll be dead before I realize people don't care about it. Um, <laughs> so that was, what I, that was what drew me in, was the lifespan. <laughs> How about you, Casey? Oh, God. Um, it sounds like a line, but the honest to God truth is I didn't choose film. Film chose me. And the reason I say that was it, it just, I, I, when I try to think back on like a time in my life where I wasn't obsessed with movies, I don't know when it was. Cause like, I mean, when I was, when I was, it's funny because this is something I've been thinking a lot about lately. When I was a kid, like we're talking four or five years old, um, my dad was a teacher, so we didn't have any money because we don't pay our teachers enough. So occasionally, he would borrow the VHS from work and bring it home. And that was like a special treat. And we would go to the library and we would rent like 10 movies and I would watch just like The Dark Crystal over and over and over again. But I think I grew up with the sense that movies were a treat. They were something special. They were like something else that wasn't a part of day-to-day -day life and so I just kind of went that's what I want to do and I never stopped much to my detriment so I'm still <laughs> doing it. Uh, well I guess I'd have to blame my parents. <laughs> All right. uh, the uh, combination of uh, the from a very small like starting about two they would take me to movies 
Hughes. Okay. Uh, and uh, my parents, before I was born, had a wedding gift, which was a Super 8 film camera. And uh, I'd say about the time I was nine, my dad showed me how to use that and play around with it. I had a little real real editor. So I'd get neighborhood kids together and just make goofy stuff and try and do special effects. And uh, I've just been really drawn to it. Uh, uh, just the idea of uh, capturing things on film or video and, and then uh, later in life, you know, really, oh, I can tell stories. And, and you know, it's a powerful tool. Uh, so, um, but yeah, it started out very early. Um, and, and also, uh, throughout my childhood and teen years, you know, just that was always like something we did all the time was go see movies. Because, uh, you know, dating myself a little bit, we didn't have a VCR, you know, VCRs weren't really a thing when I was a kid, so there wasn't until in the 80s, you know, there wasn't really, you know, renting movies and watching movies at home, that was kind of a newer thing, so it was always going to the theater. I'd also um, set up like a little movie theater in the basement and then have all the neighborhood kids come after we made the movie and show the movie to all the, to all the kids. So. You, you all kind of remind me of myself in that way, too, where it was an early passion, and then pretty much once you decided that movies were my thing, you just went off and running. You never contemplated, well, maybe I'll, you know, go be a basketball player, or go be a doctor. It's like, movies, that, that's just my, that's my path. And for some people, like I, I kind of joked about it earlier, being involved in it can make you love it less. Do you all still love movies the way you did? Me? Yeah. yeah. Whoever wants to speak up. Uh, well, that's probably an obvious no if I saw it before I answer. Um, I would say that if you're really involved in the full process, it, it, for me at least, it does kind of inevitably ruin it a little bit. Um, certainly, you can't watch them the same way. Um, you're overly aware of everything that goes into it. And I, I think if it's, it, has to, it has to achieve something more to, to still draw you in like it used to. Because if it doesn't, then you're back in your chair editing and remember thinking of what you would do and, and you're not paying attention to the story or the character. So I would say, I, you know, it reminds me of work. Um, you can kind of sour the things you love a little bit if you uh, make it into a career. So I would say keep that in mind. But, um, but maybe just the love, I guess, transfers in a different way. And maybe the love of creation was more, more of my love than uh, being a spectator. I don't know. I, when I, I used to teach filmmaking for a time, and my students always used to get really mad at me and tell me, you've ruined movies for me forever. And I my said, mom tells me that too. Oh, yeah. Okay. And it, what I always used to tell them was, no, I've just shown you what shitty movies look like. <laughs> the stuff that's good is still going to be good. Yeah. You know, I like a couple of weeks ago, I, I still have experiences. A recent example is a couple of weeks ago, I went to go see Sorry to Bother You. And that movie so blew my mind that I grabbed a group of people and went back the same night. So it can still have that effect. It just it really has to. You, you've seen behind the curtain. You've seen the man working the levers, so to speak, to use the, the age-old Wizard of Oz reference. And so, therefore, like certain things aren't going to... You, you're not going to be able to shut down in the same way and just enjoy something. But I would say when it's good, it's it's just as good because there are still filmmakers out there that are doing things that I know filmmakers that are doing things that I watch their work and I go, I don't even know how you did that. I mean, I know how you did that, but I would never have thought of that. That's just kind of so I would say yes. Yeah. Um, I'd say it's a love hate. Yeah, kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> in film school, that argument about oh, I can't watch movies the same way, but I think it adds a, a layer of um, depth in how you watch a film because you're looking at all the elements of what makes a good film, uh, uh, not just the story, you're looking at technical elements and, and everything and how it comes together. And that's the real art, taking the, you know, a good story and uh, the technical aspects and just putting it all together and making it just come off perfectly. Um, from a professional standpoint, you know, yeah, it's, it's work, it's just, it's a job. And, uh, you know, like any job, you have good days and bad days. I, 
enjoy it probably more than if I just had a steady nine to five gig. Uh, you know, so I'm grateful for that. But uh, filmmaking is for people who hate the nine to five gig. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. But you know, it, it's ups and downs, and you know, um, I've uh, kind of meandered the uh, the that path you know, for 22 years and been able to keep things going afloat. But uh, the other hard thing uh, with, with filmmaking in general is, uh, I think everybody can agree with this, is getting money together. Yeah. You know, so that's, you know, that's kind of a frustrating aspect of it. Uh, speaking for myself, one thing I, 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 I've always kind of described it as, because I, you know, from leaving film school, I really, there was this period of time where, like, watching movies felt weird because I knew so much about them. Uh, but I found I, I, me personally, I've got an innate ability where I can turn off my brain <laughs> when I'm watching something for the most part. And uh, I, I've, and I, I've realized through my time through this this weird thing of being involved in film, I've re realized there's two p types of people in the world. To use an old reference, uh, you know, they always say that one, you know, you don't, you never want to see how the sausage is made because it's going to make you not want sausage anymore. I found there's two people, two types of people: the people that see how a sausage is made and never want to touch it again. And there's the other person that sees how it's made, and they want sausage more. Uh, the good, good stuff will turn your brain off for you. That's what I found. Yeah, right. I was going to say, if there's a good film, you're not going to, you're going to stop, uh, when you're watching it, you're going to stop, like, kind of writing a critical analysis in your mind of what it is, and you're just going to be absorbed into that story. Well, it's almost, I mean, watching any film of any kind, whether it's television, it's really, I mean, you don't, I don't think a lot of people think of it, it's a bit like taking a drug, because mm -hmm. if you take away the screen that's in front of you, what are you doing? You're, you're just kind of like, <laughs> yeah. um, and things are being fed to you whether you like it or not, and it's really powerful in that way, and when you really know how the editing works here, it's inevitably manipulating you, and, and so it's really interesting, but yeah, I guess maybe it's not that you're brain dead, but just that it's, 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 it's modified how your yeah. brain is working. <laughs> you bring up a, a good point. I think there's like some sort of natural human tendency to want to alter your consciousness in some way, whether whether you're doing drugs or drinking or reading a book or watching a film or playing a video game, you're kind of taking your mind somewhere else and, 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 the, and the film yeah. does and, that. And they're know? all dangerous while driving. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That, that goes back to Plato, because it's, you know, the old famous Plato's allegory of the cave where all the people are watching the shadows on the wall, and when the person gets dragged out into the daylight kicking and screaming, they want the shadows back. And what's really funny about that old analogy is, is that Plato essentially saw movies so long before movies were a thing. Now we're all just sitting in the caves watching the shadows play out and experiencing life vicariously through our screens, which is just kind of funny. One thing I wanted to touch on, uh, you, you brought up a, a topic that I actually have in my notes. You, you mentioned, uh, you know, a little bit earlier about uh, the, the, the aspect of getting money together to make a film. And that can be a lot of times what disillusions a lot of young filmmakers into not pursuing it as far as they can. You know, oh, I don't have the money to make this. I, I shouldn't do it. Or sometimes it's you, you get so used to, you know, with crowdfunding being a thing, you get used to having something to make a movie that you don't know what to do anymore when you've got nothing to make a movie. So you've all, all of you have made impressive projects in one way or another. Uh, some very low budget, some not. Some have had bankroll. I don't know all the details behind all of your projects, but I, funding is a mystery for a lot of us. Do you have any secrets? Do you, or maybe not even necessarily secrets, but what keeps you going if you can't find funding? There's a lot in that question. So forces you having little or no money forces you to be resor more resourceful. You yep. just have to figure out a way to do it. Yeah. Um, uh, my my good friend and the co-director of Three Days, uh, who did not have um, film background, uh, he got the bug being involved with our project, and he wanted to make another project. He had no money, didn't have, you know, the skills uh, really from, you know, making films. But uh, long story short, he ended up shooting a short on an iPhone 6S. Right he figured out a way to record sound separately and sync it up. 
he had someone that could edit that was willing to help out edit. And he got people together that could help him. And he made it on a shoestring budget. And it, and it, uh, it turned out fairly good, considering what it is. If you really want to tell a story, you'll figure out a way to do it, whether it's, you know, I don't think money should be a deterrent in this. It, the, uh, it, should, it should never be a deterrent. Like, I spent, I have experience with that where I spent six, almost seven years of my life trying to get funding for a script that we cast a bunch of really well-known actors in, and there was a lot of heat, and I had to go to L.A. and do meetings, and then the recession happened, and all the money fell through. And what I realized at the end of that was that I wasted six years of my life trying to get somebody else's money. So the thing, film more than any other art form is a collaborative medium. And there is nothing that a group of like-minded people can't do if they get together and just set their minds to doing it. Don't wait for permission, just go make your thing. There's no excuse anymore. Because all the technology that used to be so far out of, like when I started doing this, I mean, you were, you were going to be spending a grand a day renting an Aerie Bolex 16 millimeter camera and taking it out. Now you can do it on your cell phone. If you really, you know, if you really want to, there's there's a million and a half ways. If you really have a project that requires a lot of money, my biggest piece of advice is meet and befriend a lot of producers, because those are the people that are ultimately going to get you your money. You will most filmmakers that I know are really suck at business because they're creative minded people, and in order to get money, that's a completely different ethos that you also have to be really good at. So I say. That's, that's my thing. Meet a lot of producers. I have one friend that um, made a film that got really big, and the way he made it was he was tending bar at the time, and he just asked seven of his friends for $2,000 a piece. And each one of those people put in their money, and that's what he made it off of. Or no, it's fifteen hundred because it was around ten thousand dollars. He made it, and I, I jokingly tell him that film played the whole world because it literally did. So it's like there's a million different ways to. Uh, what's the old adage? You can skin a cat a million different ways. It's a really gross adage. I don't like it, but you know what I'm saying when I <laughs> what, what I mean when I say it. Oh no, that's just my two cents, and I agree with him. If you want to tell a story, there's nothing stopping you from telling that story. Funding is sort of, I don't want to say it's secondary, but you know. I've never had much luck with your, it. Your production quality might not be yes. where you want it to be. But again, if, if you have a really good story, if you have a good script, people, I think, are willing to forgive, you know, something that's maybe lacking technically, you know, for, for the, you know. I like the, Robert, good story. I like the Robert Rodriguez thing that he said. He's like, when he made uh, El Mariachi, which then led to Desperado, which then led to all of, Robert Rodriguez's films. He said, I knew I had a motorcycle and a guitar, so he just wrote a film about a guy with, who rides a motorcycle and plays guitar. So what? Write, write, don't write about what you don't have, write about what you do have. And that's the easiest way to get to where you're trying to go. Yeah, I would say um, that I agree with them, especially today, um, you can literally make it on your cell phone. Surely, especially with your first one, I mean, I'm I've been doing it a while now. I'm on my fourth or fifth, however you define it, sixth maybe. Favors do start to run out. But, um, but for the most part, you're going to be able to get started. You're going to be able to make something. And I think the filmmaker of today is that there's actually a different problem with money, is that you're, you're going to be able to make your film if you're passionate enough, if you're determined to see it through to the end. You'll finish that film. But like these festival guy, guys are saying, they're getting 700 submissions. That's just one of them. The other guy also probably got 700, and probably 20 of them might have been the same. And then that other guy had another 700, and those were all made this year. The fact that it's easier for you to make a film now, it's also easier for everybody to make a film now. Yeah. And the new problem is, now that it's done, how do I get it seen? And that's where you're going to need more money. And that's where you got to get good at selling it. And even getting them to watch it, because you listen to them, oh my god, it's seven minutes. No way am I finishing this thing. Um, it's, it's, that's, I think, the hardest thing that's now you try to figure that out. <laughs> One thing I remember hearing a lot when I was coming up through film school and even directly after it was, and this would even come from, um, you know, people who were teaching at the, the school at the time, where if you want to make it in film, you've got to leave Wisconsin. 
And that was always in the back <laughs> of my brain, but I kept telling myself, I don't want to leave Wisconsin. And some of that was from fear. I'll be the first to admit I was afraid to leave. My, my, my family was here. My friends were here. I, when, I, when I met my wife, she was here. I didn't want to leave. But I kept chugging and pursuing and finding different mediums just so that way I can keep filming my life because that was what was important to me. It wasn't necessarily being a rich and famous director, just being involved in film in one way or another. And all of you, have, have, uh, I, I, I don't know your, your personal histories, but you're all here now. Whether or not you, you know, had a cup of coffee in another state or what have you. How, how do you feel coming up and learning filmmaking in Wisconsin and trying to pursue it here has benefited you, if at all? I came to Wisconsin to make movies. <laughs> I, I, I actually, yeah, uh, I, in April of next year, I will have lived in the Milwaukee area for five years. Um, I, can t I can tell you this. Back in, say, the early 90s during the indie film boom, it was absolutely super important to go to L.A. and meet all of those people. Now, a very successful cinematographer friend of mine said something that I always think about. He said, don't go to Hollywood, make Hollywood come to you. And at first I scoffed at that, but then I thought, you know what, that's right. Because if you're doing something really good and you're making a little buzz wherever you are, they're gonna come find you because they're the great exploiters of everything. If something's good, <laughs> they're going to come and find it. Um, all the, I weirdly, for as uh, unsuccessful as I've been, I know of, ridiculously successful amount of filmmakers. And when I go to film festivals all over the country, one thing I've noticed recently, none of them live in Los Angeles. They all made their films where they were. Take, you know, extrapolate from that as you will. But when I came here, I don't know what it was about coming here. It just worked. It just clicked. I met a lot of people that had similar ideas and been making movies. And I just, you know, finished my first feature film. And that, you know, so it's like, I don't know. That's just how it worked out for me. I've been a lot worse places. I think Wisconsin, particularly this part of Wisconsin, is like lousy with talent. There's so many great talented people here who just want to do great stuff. So I don't know. My my thing is stay here and just try and make good stuff. That's, uh, I would. I think it really depends on what your goals are. That's true. Uh, yeah. If in, in the Milwaukee area, there's a, a, a like you said, a, a really talented pool of people making films. I think if you want to get something made, you, you want to make your own project, uh, a short film or, or a feature, um, I think you're going to have an easier time doing that here than if you lived in New York, for example. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, absolutely. But that being said, you know, if, if you want to be a producer working at a studio or you have a TV show that you want to get on a network or something like that. Honestly, this probably isn't the right place to be. It's in a, I think Milwaukee is still a very uh, affordable place to live. Cost of living is, is, is low, and that enables uh, creative people to have some extra money and time to yeah. uh, create projects. You know, if you're living in New York, you're, you know, you're right on a treadmill. Things are expensive. You're just trying to pay the bills, you know, uh, which doesn't leave a lot of time for, you know, creative endeavors. So, so there, it's a great place for your own projects. But again, if, if you're looking at something really big, uh, you know, on a professional level, then yeah, you might want to think about moving out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, from my perspective, I've, um, I've been doing it here since, I mean, I've lived in other cities for around a year, but most of my life I've lived here. And I, my first submission to a festival was in 2005, and I've made something almost every year since then. Uh, three features I've made here, and it, with the shows I've made, it's over 20 hours of stuff. And at this point, um, it seems like I'm in a, not in a good city, um, because... I don't know what to do with all of that here. And there's nobody that really knows what to do with all that. And I don't get a lot of interest from people around here. And I just, I don't know that people really know what to ultimately do with all of this talent here. There's plenty of talented people here, but I just, I don't, I, I feel like this is one of my favorite events of film in Wisconsin is Ross's festival. Because I do feel that community when I, when I meet with you guys. He also does meetups 
um, a couple of times a year, and I, I've met you through that, and, and it's, it's great to talk with the people here, but I just find that most of them are having the same struggle, or they're sort of a darling of somebody that has decided, you know, this is my click, and I don't know, it's weird. You wouldn't think there would be a clicks in a small city, but it does happen, and, if, and when, you're, when you're on the wrong side of that, it's like, what do I do? Um, and so I, I, I just think, like, if, if, if your goal is to make something, well, then you could look at me and say, oh, I can make something. I've certainly done that. But if you want, you know, if you want all that work to be seen by people, I, I find this to be a really hard place to get things seen. That's my, my experience, but it's like I was very optimistic, and it kind of beat me down over the years. Well, one thing I've, no, I've noticed about Milwaukee, or Wisconsin in general, but Milwaukee seems to be the hub of, of culture in a lot of ways, where there's a lot of not only independently owned movie theaters, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people out there doing things. Hell, there's even that dude who, sh who sets up a, a Paul's back, Back alley cinema. He just sets up a screen in an alley and just Wait, shows what? a movie. Well, yeah. I, where, where is I have not heard about. Okay, this. but I would say one thing about the theaters here is that you know, ten years ago when I was premiering some of these things, places like the Rosebud, the Times, um, even the Oriental or the Downer, um, they were a lot more accessible. And a lot of those theaters have been bought out, and they have contracts with companies that oh, you want to show Star Wars, you want to show the Avengers. Well, you have to pay us this much for the reel. And now you have to sell this many tickets per night. And therefore, for somebody like me, well, you have to match. If you want to have your premiere on a Saturday, who doesn't want to premiere their movie on a day when people will actually come? Well, now you have to match all the ticket sales of Star Wars, assuming we would have filled this Star Wars show, no matter how far in the release. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's actually become these huge barriers where, where do you even go now? And I get that, but like, what do you think we could do about it? So, I, like, we, you know... Ross, for example, you mentioned Ross. He started this film festival from practically nothing. Right. He brought it up from the ground, and he gave people a platform to show things. Do you think that as you know, all the creatives in this city could do something on their own? I've got friends on my Facebook who all they spend more time complaining about how they can never get their stuff seen instead of finding a way to get their stuff seen. Yeah. What do you think we could do as a film community to help us around this? <clears throat> well, Local, locally, you're talking about. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to say... Uh, Ross uh, is doing a great job, I think, of really looking at, you know, a broad spectrum of filmmakers, different backgrounds. You know, you mentioned clicks and things like that. Uh, and, and I don't get that uh, uh, impression with this particular festival. And I think kind of uh, more avenues like the short film festival, uh, the way uh, Ross is running that would definitely be helpful. But also, you need to, um, you know, work on the, you know, not only having those avenues, but uh, getting people to come to it, and, you know, getting the word out and promoting it. I think, trying to say this as politically <clears throat> proper as possible because uh, I agree with him about the click thing I mean, he's and he's not, not talking adults. about yeah. yeah I think the biggest there there are two obstacles that you have to go through yeah. to do it locally the first is get rid of the gatekeepers this community has a lot of filmmaking gatekeepers none of them are associated with the short film festival you can extrapolate from that what you will <laughs> Talk to me later after I've had a couple more beers, I'll tell you all about them. <laughs> the second thing that we have to do is, is one thing that's starting to happen, and I've really noticed it over the past couple of years, is that there's been a huge, like, revivalist cinema stuff happening. Um, Oriental's now doing it, but Times is doing it because they have Friday Night Freak Show, stuff like that. The thing that I would put forward is, is if we have all of these programs that, like, once a month are showing this film or that film, why can there not be programs at some of these local theaters where, just like any other film festival, only year-round, we're showing local films? He's made four feature films. Why can't I go see one of his feature films some night at Times? You know, not to... Times has actually been very good to me. I'm not going <laughs> signaling them out. I'm just saying they are a great local theater that's great to go. Also, they have one of the best sound systems, so if you can, like, show your film there, it's, yeah. 
But um, I think that's, I think you need to get rid of the gatekeepers that say, this represents Milwaukee and this doesn't represent Milwaukee. Uh, I should throw in, you mentioned the Oriental, that yeah. is now owned and operated by Milwaukee. I, I know that. So. <laughs> I'm trying not to talk about okay, them right now. Here's, here's another, <laughs> here's another, here's another, let's get back to the topic on hand. Here's yeah. one more thing then I would say too, and this is, would be, if for any of them that are still here, is more of a challenge to the festival organizers, which is that we've listened and we can read the directions on Without a Box and Film Freeway and the websites that say, this is what we're looking for. And we can hear them say, this is what we're looking for, and say, I want a film that has heart, that has character, that has passion, where I can just, where I want to help these filmmakers, and, and where they want to come and be involved, where they've written their bio, and they've written their synopsis, and they've got their stills because they care that much about it. And, it's, and to me, it's a little bit like if I'm on a dating website, and I say, I want somebody who's funny, who's caring, who's kind, who will stand by me, who will look out for me, who's going to be there for me at night when I need them. And then in practice, I want somebody who's very attractive, who has social status, who has money. And I think that's an analogy of, of, in effect, what a lot of festivals do. And I'm not saying any of these ones in particular, but a lot of festivals operate the way of who's, more, who's going to look better next to me. And I wish that they would actually stand by what they say that they're looking for. And that's a challenge to all the festival directors to really self-evaluate, really be introspective and say, Am I really supporting my community? Am I really picking the films that fit what I've written here? Or am I just trying to be the cool kid, basically? And one, one thing I'd like to add to that is, uh, before we open it up to uh, questions of those in the audience, one thing I'd like to add to that is, you know, we're all filmmakers, we're all passionate about cinema, and we've all been vocal, too, about these things, about uh, it needs to be easier for us to get our stuff shown. Like I said, there are there are filmmakers, there are film there are film festivals, there are things out there that are trying to do that. But I think a big thing too is you know you all love film. You're here for a reason. You all love uh, what film festivals like this have to offer. If you're if you, if you want counter programming, let people know. If you want to see more films from people like this or people who have films in these festivals, let people know. Let your voices be heard so that way they know that there's a market out here for this. So I think that would be the last thing I'll have to say before we open it up to them because we are running out of time. So sure. if you want to see more local films in any anywhere, not just here, if you want to see more in, truly independent film, because independent as a title has changed quite a bit. Now oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> Fox has got their own independent <laughs> label and it's not truly independent. If you want to see more truly independent films, let people know. So now I'm going to open it up to you guys. I feel like we got pretty passionate up here. Who's got a question for these guys? Someone. I mean, not What's up, bro? Question. I, I mean, everything you guys did, I, I mean, I agree with everything you said, but with everything you said, like with the, the budget and location, and just, I just thought it was a few years ago, but like, when I was last year, when I went to start doing film film, I started watching my films again, I started analyzing all this stuff. I didn't like with all this stuff. You don't have any knowledge of all this stuff. You know, it's just you got bills to pay. I live in an area, I live two, two hours outside of the Atlanta, so I'm two hours from out here. And the area I live in is so real small, and not many people are, you know, been more interested in respecting the city and too far from so. I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like, if I do so, I'm out there like always constantly there, all the area, just, you know, with my camera, just like doing everything. Sometimes you see in the background, just like, you know, people in cars, just cars filled away, stuff like that. So you might catch some of that stuff out of my work, but like, how do I, like, necessarily, how do I get other people motivated? The way I am to do certain things that they're just like, have you bring, even bring it into like some more now that they're having some watch books, for them to come this way and just like, hey, listen, you know, as long as they're catching my drift, but it's like, it just seems like. I would say patience and lead by example. The one thing I learned a long time ago the only person that you can truly depend upon is yourself. That's why I almost killed myself making my feature film, writing it, directing it, shooting it myself, writing the entire score, and editing it. Yeah. Don't ever try to do that with a feature film. I almost ended up in, like, therapy over it. I mean, it, it will wreck you. But lead by example. Just create a body of work. When I started doing stuff, when I was making short films, 
nobody cared. By the time I got to the fifth, sixth, seventh short film and like friends started watching it, then friends started talking to friends. It's all about, like he was saying, it's all word of mouth. If people see your passion, people are going to want to be a part of your passion. Yeah, that's definitely it. You can convince people of anything if they believe that you believe it. So you can hear it in our voice, like, oh, that person believes in what they're saying. And I'm starting to believe what they're saying. And we could be saying bullshit, but if it sounds like I believe in what I'm saying, and you can hear it in my voice, and you feel like my heart's connecting with yours, then you start to believe what I'm saying. So push it out. You're doing the right thing. Yeah. I'd say, you know, I'd reiterate what these two have said in the, yeah, charisma and perseverance. Just keep going, you know, just a really positive attitude. Uh, and uh, when I did three days, it was just calling in favors, you know. I, I kind of built up some karma. I kind of compare it to moving. You know, you have moving, <laughs> yeah. moving karma where you, you help your friends, and then when it's time for you to move, they help you, that kind of a thing. Um, and just stayed positive, even if there was something that got screwed up or someone, you just you gotta stay in a, in a real positive mindset to make it happen. Cause if you don't, you know, it's, it's going to be problematic. And, and some advice I got was, uh, you know, you really have to believe in your project and, you know, is it a story you want to see and, 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 and uh, want to make? And if, if the answer is yes, then just do it. Don't get wrapped up in what other people think about stuff. I think we had a question from over here. Yes, you guys talked a lot about seeing very little in theaters and screening your movies and you know, getting to know the seats. But how does that compare to the discourse that is in your mind now? Like when you, you know, you said you do movies and movies. And where's the, you know, where's the balance there? Like of course. Well, I, I think that, uh, I think showing online, I mean, you're, you're trying to, at least for me, you know, if I make a project, I want people to see it. So if they're going to see it on YouTube or Vimeo or whatever, great. If they're going to see it in the theater, I think the theatrical experience is, uh, uh, can't be duplicated on your phone. It's great for people to come out. But the point is when you make something, you want people to see it. So. Uh, from a short film standpoint, I don't think any of us are looking at this like we're going to make money off of a short film. No. It's not. Um, <laughs> you're doing it uh, for yourself or maybe as a stepping stone to something bigger. Uh, so whether it's YouTube or theater, um, I, I don't really discriminate in that regard as far as yeah. the venue. You, you shouldn't discriminate. People watching your work is people watching your work. But the other thing you have to understand is like, you specifically mentioned YouTube and Vimeo. YouTube has a very specific audience. The highest views on YouTube are going to be for cat videos or for Nazis getting punched out. That's what people go to YouTube to see, quick little clipped things. People go to Vimeo usually, this has just been my experience, to watch short films, to watch demo reels. I don't think I've ever seen a professional person send out the demo reel that was on YouTube. It was almost always on Vimeo or a privately hosted site. But yeah, you can't, it's like he said, you can't discriminate views or views. 
You know, you've got to create a fan base because nobody's ever going to give you money or want to show your films unless there's a demand to look at your film. And that's an, it's a great way. The one thing I will say, and I have arguments with this because like most independent filmmakers, I have a day job and I actually do this for a living too. And one thing I always argue with is do not trust views and aggregators on YouTube and Vimeo, they are notoriously untrustworthy. Like for example, like you might look at something and most of them say like, uh, you know, so-and-so watch this and they stopped watching it at five minutes. If that, <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably not true. What could end up happening a lot of times is that, and this also helps your views, is that their internet crapped out and they have to press play again. Boom, there's another view you got. You get three views off of one person. So it's very difficult to trust. But like I said, I don't know. I'm kind of going on a tangent. Don't discriminate. People watching your stuff is people watching your stuff. But trust me, there is no feeling like sitting in a darkened theater with a crowd full of people and hearing them react to something that you have done. Yeah. But in case you're asking, which is like, what should I put more energy into? Probably the internet. Because there's a lot more people there. There's a lot more money. It's, it's, it's like they say, it's unmatched to be in the theater. That's the best by far. But it's becoming more of a novelty. And you're going to have a hard time getting the contracts, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, to actually have a, sig a significant theater run of, theatrical run of any kind. So places like YouTube are good, Vimeo maybe better, Amazon maybe even better, um, but it's always fluctuating, so pay attention to who's allowing you to distrib distribute on their site and who has the better deals and who has the better audience reach and just play around with it because it's like, I mean, we are in uncharted territory right now, so you could end up discovering the site where you blow up and become that face that kind of launched that. I mean, look at like Joe Rogan on Netflix. He's huge now. He was the Fear Factor guy 15 years ago. I had a question. I just wanted to interject something too, going back to Clifford's comment. Clifford uh, is a filmmaker in the past, wrote his film Blast from Jordan Screen last night about his concern about <coughs> getting help or getting seen and trying to work on it. I would, I would suggest that when you guys leave here tonight, follow these filmmakers on YouTube or Vimeo. I've known Kyle for a long time. Joseph, I'm sorry. Okay. And um, the, that's how long. Yeah, that's how long. <laughs> I changed my name. There right, go. <laughs> By himself, he sold out the Oriental. Yeah. With amateur monster movie. That's a thousand seater. He sold out the Paps Theater by himself with Batman and Jesus. Too. Oh my! Yeah. And <laughs> awesome. So Thank try you. to see what these people are doing, so they can because they have people who are interested in their work, and maybe that's a way that you go. Oh, that's how he does it. Uh, let me try that too. You know, they're building a base. They're maybe using social media too. Yeah. That's was, important. Was there, there one more? Oh, oh sorry. sorry. No, please. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say there's no one way to do it. That's oh, so Every, true. Everyone has their own path to it. Just try what works for you and navigate what works for you. You know, uh, I know a lot of filmmakers, and I don't think any of them got where they were going by traveling the same path. There was always a different deviation that was wholly theirs. And it's, it's a lot of it is knowing um, uh, opportunity when you see it. You know, and just that that's the other thing, you know, being able to go, this would be a great opportunity. Don't be snotty about things. The snottier that you are as an artist, the less likely it is that people are going to see. Like, I've known filmmakers that were sort of like, well, I don't want to show at that festival. Yeah, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. show at that yeah. festival. Show For at sure. all the festivals that are willing to play you. Or they're going to say the same thing about your film. What If you don't think their festival is worth it, why should they think your film is worth it? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, and, and it's not a bad thing to, you know, we talked about getting views on the internet, but it's it's a great thing if you can get locked into a festival circuit and get some recognition that way, and it might add some uh, validity to your project if you exactly. win some war awards exactly. and things of that nature. I think that's, when it all comes down to it, that's what makes things like this important. Mm -hmm. Not only does it get you seen, but it gives you the confidence to continue on, yeah. Uh, and we're just about out of time, so Is I that, want to. Do you have time for one more question? There was one more. Question. Sure. Well, did we have? Well, should we have time for one more question? One more. Sorry. All right. Back there.
Uh, I've done a lot of that. If you don't yeah, a little bit too. Um, it it depends upon where. Yeah, scoot out from behind. I can't see you. There you are. <laughs> um, it depends upon where the footage is coming from. For example, news footage, you can just contact the news station, CNN, Fox News, whatever. They actually have a rights clearances thing. Um, there are clever things you can do to get around it. I don't know if I should say these on camera, but it is actually true because, like, I always like to use, I call it the Warhol syndrome because most of what Andy Warhol did as an artist was copyrighted material. But the way he got around it and the reason he wasn't, he became a millionaire instead of getting sued into jail was that he changed it slightly and made it his. It's like, um, there's also the, like, the hip hop rule. You can sample a song, but. It, uh, every seventh note has to be different. Other words, you're going to get sued for the sample. So I would say it depends upon where it's coming from and what your purpose is and how you plan to use it. If ed educational purposes covers a lot of area, mm -hmm. the moment you start charging people to watch it, that's when you're in dangerous water. So it depends upon what exactly you're using and how, you know, what, what you're, what your end game is. I'd need more details to really give you good advice, but I don't know what Yeah, I just, I just did a movie called Batman and Jesus. I have clips from all of the Batman movies, comics, Jurassic Park, video games. I did not license any of that, but there is such a thing as free use for certain... I mean, if, you're, if it's, like, legally speaking, if it's completely... And I'm not a lawyer, so I can't, like, tell you this for sure, so look it up yourself, but in my experience... Um, if it's completely unreasonable for you to have afforded that, it's completely unreasonable if I only have $15,000 to license Tim Burton's Batman, and it's for educational purposes, you know, I'm not remaking Batman, I'm teaching you something that requires me to show you this in order to do it, you know, that's why you see stuff like that on YouTube, and they have monetized channels, and so it depends on your budget level. If you, for probably a level that somebody's talking about here, it's probably going to be okay for you to use it if you're doing it for education or there are certain things with parity too. But um. the, the second thing I would say is too, as long as um, cover your own butt, credit everything yeah. and its source. And the other, the other uh, part of that is to understand that you're never going to get into trouble until it is financially <laughs> to the other party's benefit. Exactly. So unless you become super rich, people aren't going to go after you. Exactly. <laughs> that's, the, that's the reality. Not much motivation. Yeah. You can't get blood from a rock. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd like to thank our panel for all coming out and, yep. you know, talking for a while. As Ross said, the best thing you can do to support these guys is to keep up what they're doing. And, uh, you know, social media has kind of become a, uh, a necessary evil. So if you want to, if you've got any social media accounts you want to plug, now's the time. Joseph? Um, <clears throat> yeah, if you look up Joseph, J-O-Z-E-F, Joseph K. Richards, I'm on Twitter and YouTube. And also King's Tower Productions, um, like a king who owns a tower, King's Tower Productions. And you can look up either of those and you can find all my films or look me up, say hey. I mean, I'll say hey back. I'm not, you know, there's like 30 of you. I'm cool with that. So join me. <laughs> Casey. Uh, I'm at KCT Malone on Twitter uh, or uh, CT Malone on Instagram. Both of those, I believe, have links to my Vimeo page with a lot of my short work and trailers for the stuff that's not online. So, uh, yeah, come find me. Follow. I follow Chris, back. Uh, well, we have a three days Facebook page. Uh, and, um, I'm on uh, Twitter, CG Mark. Uh, and um, Instagram, there's uh, uh, TPP under slash uh, underscore music and um, also Future Orb. So. And I'm, I'm Michael Byers. You can find me pretty much everywhere with my name, usually Michael underscore Byers. And you can also find on uh, uh, my, my podcast, The Shameless Picture Show, on uh, Apple, well, they just changed Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Stitcher Radio, and SoundCloud. We're everywhere. So thank you guys very much for your time.